Hello, welcome to the video lecture on the poem Shape a Shade by Harindranath Chattopadhyaya. Harindranath Chattopadhyaya, the younger brother of Sarojini Naidu, is hailed as one of the brightest stars in Indian English literature. Like his sister, he is also considered to be a very prolific intellectual who left his mark in diverse arenas like poetry, drama, music and films. He has published several volumes of poetry and his poems are noted for its simple diction and profound thought. His major works include The Feast of Youth that was published in 1918, The Magic Tree in 1922, Ancient Wings in 1923, Blood of Stones in 1944 and Spring and Winter in 1955. The nation honored him with the Padma Bhushan in 1973. Shaper Shaped is a poem that uh, reflects on the evolution of the poet's consciousness. The poem is divided into four stanzas that narrate the speaker's overconfidence in the past and his way towards maturity. The poet reflects on how man is carried away by the arrogance of youth and power. The idealism of youth often takes us away from the path of self-realization. The poet acknowledges man's powerlessness before the omnipotent God and realizes the need for complete surrender to divine will. The poem is his offering to God as he learns to let go of his egoistic aspirations and selfish desires. Uh, let's now move on to the detailed analysis of the poem. In days gone by, I used to be a potter who would feel his fingers mold the yielding clay to patterns on his wheel. But now through wisdom lately won that pride has died away, I have ceased to be the potter and have learned to be the clay. In the first stanza, the speaker or the poetic persona likens himself to a potter, a potter who is fully confident of his skill. He believed that he was adept in shaping any image that he wanted from the clay. Traditionally, the image of potter is one that is associated with divinity. God as the master potter who molds us out of his clay. Here, the poetic persona admits that he had thought himself to be the potter in his youth. He thought he could shape his destiny. But as he attains maturity, he realizes that he should sacrifice his pride, his self at the altar of God and become the clay in God's hands. The pride of youth is here replaced by the wisdom of age. The speaker is content to be the clay that will be molded by God. He has given himself to God and has no more aspirations to be like God. He is happy to be the clay. In other days, I used to be a poet through whose pen innumerable songs would come to win the hearts of men. But now, through new God knowledge, which I had not had so long, I have ceased to be the poet and have learned to be the song. The second stanza depicts the speaker as a poet who thought his pen is mighty enough to produce songs, poems that would capture the hearts of other people. He thought he was the master poet who could win approval and love with the gift of his verse. Yet, as he acquires wisdom, he realizes that God is the master poet and we, his creations, are all songs that have been crafted by him. So the speaker comes to the conclusion that no matter how talented he is, he can never be like his own creator. He has given up his ego and is ready to be the song written by God, the master 
poet. That's why he says, I have ceased to be the poet and have learned to be the song. He is ready to be the song written by God. I was a fashioner of swords in days that now are gone, which on a hundred battlefields glittered and gleamed and shone. But now that I am brimming with the silence of the Lord, I have ceased to be the sword maker and have learned to be the sword. The speaker was once a fashioner of swords, someone who made swords that ruled the battlefields of yore. His creations glittered and so did his pride in his creations. He was immensely proud of the swords that he created. As a maker of swords, he basked in the glory of his shining accomplishments. But once he attains the silence of God, which stands for the dawn of wisdom, he realizes his error and learns to be the sword in the hands of his master. Here, the lines brimming with the silence of the Lord and I have ceased to be the sword maker and have learned to be the sword. That refers to the infinite wisdom that can only be attained through silent contemplation. Ever since the speaker became wise, he was brimming with silence that led him to his enlightenment. In bygone times, I used to be a dreamer who would hurl on every side an insolence of emerald and pearl. But now that I am kneeling at the feet of the Supreme, I have ceased to be the dreamer and have learned to be the dream. In the last stanza, the poetic persona reveals that in his past, he taught himself to be a dreamer who can change the world around him. He thought his ideas were worthy enough to create a new world. Here, dreamer can also uh, refer to a godlike figure because many mythologies see creation as a dream of God. Thus, uh, the speaker here thought of himself as a divine creator, but as he knelt in God's presence, he understood his limitations. He realized that he is just one among the infinite dreams seen by the omnipotent God. He is no longer frantic to assume the role of a creator. Instead, he is happy to be the creation. As you look at all the four stanzas, you realize that all these stanzas depict a change in the speaker's perspective. It is a contrast between the speaker's past that is steeped in ignorance and his present that has been blessed by the light of enlightenment. So as the speaker learns to let go of his arrogant past, he becomes a pliable tool in the hands of God and is ready to accept God's will as his own. He is no longer subject to the whims of ego. As he has conquered the selfish and base desires of the egoistic self. He is at peace. The speaker is at peace, having attained a sense of harmony with his creator, God. I hope all of you understood the poem. That's all for now. Thank you.